Hey, bosses, before we kick off this episode, let me tell you about our sponsor, Nom Nom. Your pet's a member of the family, so don't feed them like they're in the doghouse. Give them Nom Nom. Nom Nom delivers fresh dog food with every portion, personalized to your dog's needs, so you can bring out their best. Nom Nom is made with real, whole food you can see and recognize without any additives or fillers that contribute to bloating and low energy. That's because Nom Nom uses the latest science and insights to make real, good food for dogs. Their nutrient-packed recipes are crafted by board-certified veterinarian nutritionists made fresh and ship-free to your door. In fact, Nom Nom's already delivered over 40 million meals to good dogs like yours, inspiring millions of clean bowls and tail wags. And Nom Nom sent me a sample pack. I'm going to tell you all about it coming up during the break in the show. Seriously, this stuff looks so good. I almost ate it myself. If you want to check out Nom Nom for yourself, you should go right now to get 50 50% off a no-risk two-week trial when you go to trynom.com slash iLab. That's try, T-R-Y, nom, N-O-M, dot com slash I-L-A-B. T-R-Y, N-O-M, dot com slash I-L-A-B. It's trynom.com slash iLab. All right, let's kick off this episode of Invest Like a Boss. Welcome to the Invest Like a Boss podcast. I'm Sam Marks. I'm Derek Sparks. And I'm Johnny FD. We're self-made entrepreneurs who invest our own money and use modern technology to invest like a boss. Join us each week for exclusive interviews with our network of modern investors, business owners, and multimillionaires to discover new ways to invest our hard-earned cash. Hey, bosses, and welcome to another special episode. This is going to be a cool one-on-one. I'm here with Sam Marks. Hey, Johnny. Greetings from a very sunny and beautiful end of spring here in South Carolina. Well, welcome to summer, baby. I'm in Ukraine, and actually, summer here is amazing. It's it's warm, but not too hot. Grasses are green. The lake is cool. It's probably similar to to the Carolinas. So funny. I called Johnny, not for anything work-related, just to catch up the other day. And like, newsflash, there's a bunch of bombs falling on on Kiev, and Kiev's attacking Moscow with its own drones. And I'm like, Johnny, are you all right? How's everything going? He's like, yeah, it's great. You know, the flowers are in full bloom. I'm sitting here at the cafe. They got a little music playing. Everyone's walking the streets. It's like... Whoa, it's not the, not the story I'm seeing on TV. Well, there's two sides to every story. I mean, like mm-hmm. last week, I got caught in a daytime bombing where we were like running into the shelters, like there's explosions ahead. It's a, it's a very, it's a dichotomy. It's, it's both at the same time. But you're happy to be back in, in Kiev, contrary to our, I guess our Far East adventures recently. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I love Thailand and we could probably talk about this more in the, the next quarter of the update, but it's, mm-hmm. it's good for vacation. It was good for those eight or 10 years of my life, but there's nowhere I'd rather be than Kiev right now. That's incredible. Glad to hear and looking forward to catching up with you more about it on the quarterly updates. I know we got a lot to share, but yeah. in this episode, we've got a kind of a long awaited, we're going to, this is specifically for 2023, but it's sort of a kind of a 101 savings episode. But now with interest rates, Peaking up, inflation's pretty high. We think it's a perfect time to record sort of a, a deeper dive into savings uh, practices and and options for higher yield savings. Yeah, and if you guys haven't heard our previous one-on-one episodes uh, or checked out some of the blog posts uh, on investlikeaboss.com, you can go there. We go into you know tax savings in one-on-one or how to invest your first X amount of money, you know, tips for uh, college students or you know kind of young people. But today's episode is really going to be for everyone, right? Because I am a big, big proponent that everyone needs to have some kind of emergency fund in a savings account that is just, it's liquid. It's not some kind of um, commodity that can go up and down. It's not a cryptocurrency that goes up and down. Something that kind of just stays stable and you can pull on it and live off of it for six months, 12 months, two years in case uh, you something happens and you never know what's going to happen, right? That's right. And we've kind of outlined some of the best practices that you guys can apply and or consider when you're putting together your own savings and investing plan. But Johnny, I was thinking, you know, your story of how you got started is so applicable, I think, to the masses in terms of the way that that you did it through very diligent and uh, disciplined savings. Maybe it's worth sharing kind of kind of how you got set up with this originally and, and how you structured it to get to where you've gotten so far. Yeah. So I've always been pretty frugal. My parents, you know, always would fight about money when I was a kid and sometimes we would go paycheck to paycheck. So I always try not to have any debt. 
and I always wanted to build up some kind of uh, emergency fund. And honestly, you know, at the time, I thought emergency fund just spent $1,000. <laughs> but in reality, that doesn't really do much. Uh, and most Americans, you know, they basically you know, live paycheck to paycheck. So if you get sick, if there's a recession, if there's a natural disaster, uh, if there's an earthquake, if there's war, if there's a, you know, pandemic, you can be screwed in just one or two months. So I think the prudent amount of time is 12 to 24 months of your cost of living in some kind of savings account. And for me, the hack I did was instead of trying to have 24 times, you know, $4,000 a month, which would be a very, very difficult amount of money for anyone to save really, you know, that'd be like almost a hundred grand. I decided, well, you know, what if I just slash my cost of living as cheap as possible? <laughs> and that way, you know, 24 months times 600 bucks is 14 grand. It's a, it's a lot more doable. Yeah, I agree with that. And you kind of did it to the, the next level of actually cutting your costs. But for other people, I think it's just worth knowing what they can get their costs down to. So yeah, you might have that extra Netflix su subscription. You might have those up additional uh, services that you subscribe to you don't need. So whether you cut them or don't cut them, just knowing that you have the ability to cut them uh, if times got tough is important. So one good exercise you might do now is just go through your monthly expenses and figure out what's necessary to actually live. Like if times got really tough, what could you cut your savings to? What would you be willing to cut your savings to? Because you know, it's it's one thing to say that you can cut that, but it's another thing to do it. A lot of people aren't willing to give up that Netflix subscription, right? That's like a hundred percent a necessity at this point. Yeah. Well, you know, the funny thing is, I I know so many people who pay not just for Netflix, but they pay for Netflix you know, maybe Apple TV, maybe HBO Plus and something else. For me, it never made sense. Like just have one per month. You can always cancel it or pause it and then say, well, this month I'm watching, you know, I'm binge watching everything on HBO that, you know, I wanted to catch up mm -hmm. on or, you know, then I'm going to pause that or cancel it. Next month, I'm going to watch all of Ted Lasso on Apple TV, binge watch that and then pause, you know, pause that. <laughs> like just have one a month. This is what I do. It basically forces you to subscribe to get credits or you got to pay like really high uh, price per, per download. So I like subscribe, download one book, unsubscribe for three months, then subscribe three months later, unsubscribe. Because otherwise I end up getting like, you know, I have like eight credits for audiobooks in the bank. And I'm like, I'm not going to, I have to like force myself to binge listen to books now, which isn't always a bad idea. It's good, kind of a good way to spend time, but it becomes totally unnecessary. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, most finance shows will talk about you know, saving money on your daily latte. You know, at the end of the day, that five bucks a day is not going to, it's not really going to break the bank. It's more about when people spend 20 bucks here, 30 bucks here, 50 bucks here, a lot of it's going out to eat, you know, instead of just cooking at home or bringing food. Uh, a lot of it is high car payments. You know, we're buying anything that's a liability and not an asset, you know, so anything that isn't making money. Uh, buying clothes. I, I used to be so guilty of buying so much clothes. And I thought I was being smart because I was only buying things that are on sale. It turns out these are always on sale. And there's only so many $30 shirts <laughs> that you can buy before it adds up to a lot. Definitely. And one thing. Thing also that's interesting speaking to the international audience is expenses vary country to country and the types of poor expenses that you have differentiate. And let me give you an example. In Spain, I don't know if you guys recall, but going back maybe six months ago, I was complaining about my energy bill, which had crept up to about 300 euros a month. And I'm just a single guy that lives in a, in a climate that has pretty much the best weather all year round where you don't really need heat or air conditioning. I was spending like $300 a month on what refrigeration and some lights is what it felt like. So like, this is, this is crazy, right? Then while I was out of town, I asked some, um, the lady that actually helps um, me around the house to see if she can figure out how to switch the energy, because frankly, it's so damn complicated if you're not like Spanish speaking. And so she was able to get it switched over. And my new energy bill now is less than a hundred euros a month. It's like 80 euros a month just by switching energy companies. Wow. I think what happened was the, uh, the energy company I was using is more for commercial purposes and less for residential residential and somehow I got synced up to them and they charge like more per, per kilowatt and or have higher minimums. But I was shocked to see how much it changed by just switching energy companies. So some certain things to look into because it, as an American in the US, you don't really have a choice of energy company, right? You just have like one energy company that powers the local area and you just pay 
whatever they're charging on a kilowatt basis. Yeah, but at least now we have alternatives. You know, you can add solar. You know, if you live in a sunny area, maybe uh, that'll be worth the investment putting in or use something like Solar City, where they can even loan you the 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 panels and, and you pay it off. Mm-hmm. So either, there's always some way to do it. But, you know, basically, before you start, you're trying to set this huge savings goal, which might seem impossible, figure out how much you can possibly cut down your expenses. You're kind of, uh, you know, not how much you spend per month now, but how much you can live off of if you had to. Uh, and get that to something reasonable where it seems like a goal you could actually make. So that's that's talking about unnecessary expenses and we're talking about setting a savings goal. Do you want to talk about that more, Johnny, before we get into some of the other best practices? Yeah, absolutely. The number one best thing you could do is have a separate savings account that's not connected to your checking account mm-hmm. and have the money go in there automatically. So just have it come out of your paycheck so you're not, you don't even see it. Uh, you'll forget about it. I, I, pr- I promise you, like the first month, it'll it'll feel skimp. But by the second, third, fourth month, you'll forget that that money's even there. And one day you'll look at it like, wow, actually, I have a lot in my savings account now. So automate, automate, automate. So these, this point was really highlighted in a book by David Bach called The Automatic Millionaire. It's a great, very easy read for you know people that are new to savings and investing. And it's kind of a classic. And it really highlights the importance of automating this because it always becomes an afterthought. And as an example, when I was younger, uh, in my late teenage years at 18, 19, I was working at a, at a golf course. I actually made pretty decent money. You know, it was all cash, but it wasn't a paycheck really. I mean, my paycheck was so tiny. It was like $4 an hour or something. I made all my money in tips, which was cash. And my dad would always say at the end of of the year, he's like, you got to fund your Roth IRA. You know, I was getting this message when I'm 18. I'm like, dude, this is this is such a tough pill to swallow to like to max out your Roth IRA for Roth IRA when you're 18 years old. There's so many things you want to be spending that money on and to like put that away until you're 65. Uh, but I'm so glad I did. But it was very, very difficult. It required my dad to constantly be saying, dude, you got to you got to, you know, fund your, your Roth IRA. But the much easier way to do it is just to make it automatic. Because when you make it automatic, it's like no questions asked. You don't have to set that reminder. Because most people, if you wait until the end of the year to set that money aside, you're just not going to do it. By that time, you'll spend it on other things. But at the end of the year, you want to take a vacation with it. So you really got to make it automatic. Yeah, absolutely. And another good thing about doing it monthly straight out of your check is then you maximize the amount of interest you can get. Because if you just if it just sits around in a checks account or under your mattress for a year, you know, that's a lot of money that you're you're missing out on. Just compound interest, you know, really adds up. So absolutely one hundred percent, you know, open a separate account and have that money pulled out of your paycheck first. Or if you're in Sam's position, just deposit that whole paycheck. You don't need it, right? Because the most of the money you make is going to be from cash. You know, uh, and, and ironically, I remember I, I actually, I was talking to a, uh, a stripper and <laughs> yeah. How uh, many of Johnny's <laughs> stories start like this? Yeah. Well, I was talking to her about how to like save money and she was telling me like she was having such a hard time. And I said, I know how much money, you know, how much do you earn? And she said tips, you know, anywhere between you know, 200 on a slow night to a thousand on a good night or, you know, on some nights even, even more. And then I found out she also gets paid minimum wage just as a, like a legal requirement. And the amount of money she had in total net worth or bank account was so low that I was like, you know, even if you only de- deposited your minimum wage check every month and just didn't touch that, you would have more money, mm-hmm. you know, saved up than you do now. And I was like, I was like, you have to, like, you have to pay, you know, just save first. Uh, I don't know if she ever took my advice or not, but it's, I mean, that's the way to do it. And save first. Another way you guys can think of this is what's, which is how it's presented in the book, uh, Automatic Millionaire, is to pay yourself first. And Johnny's mentioned this, basically get yourself paid out of every paycheck first. This kind of goes hand in hand with automating aut- automation of your savings. You pay yourself first and you automate it. And so the automation part is like, okay, at the end of each, whenever you receive your first paycheck, let's say it's on the first of the month, the last thing you want to do is go into your bank account and or, t- or deposit that check and then try to move some of that money over manually into a savings account. Because if you have to take just that step, chances are you're going to forget it nine times out of 10, or you're going to de- procrastinate, delay it. It's just not going to happen. What you want to do is set it up automatically through your banks or in- and or investment accounts. And this is this can be applied to 
various different ways. It doesn't just mean a paycheck into a savings account. It can mean your Vanguard dividends that get automatically uh, reinvested back into the stocks. That's another way you can think of it. So it really applies to all different types of wealth levels and all different types of incomes. What's key is that whenever you get money in, you you save and or reinvest that automatically. No manual transmission of, of the funds by yourself. Yeah, because even I'm pretty good at going in and you know, dollar cost averaging buying, um, you know, more index funds all the time. But in reality, I only do it like four times a year when I remember I'm like, oh, crap, it's been a while or I have too much cash yeah. in my bank account now. <laughs> so <laughs> especially with savings, you just have to just have that pull out. And, and it's nice. Most most banks, especially all these online banks, have a automatic transfer you can set up for, the, for this, you know, same day you get paid, uh, or the same day every month. And we're really lucky that in 2023, you can actually earn really good interest on this because I would say ever since we started this podcast, I mean, savings interest rates were almost like zero. It, it was mm-hmm. almost not worth even having a savings account. Yeah, it's ex- it's very true. Now it makes it it makes it better, right? Like it makes it actually enjoyable because you see interest coming in. And this reminds me when I was when I was a kid. This goes back to the golf course working days. This goes back to when I was just getting ten dollars of allowance each week uh, for doing my chores on time by my parents. But I would always save that money, and because back then when I was you know say age eight. 9, 10, interest rates were much higher. And I would put the money into a Fidelity savings account and I would get this printed paper receipt every, or it was basically like an account statement every single quarter. And it would show the interest payments being paid each quarter. And back then it was meaningful enough that even as like a kid, I'm like, wow, if I put the money in the bank and I get more money in the bank, my interest payments get bigger. And then I would use the interest payments to go buy like Legos and stuff like that. And that's because interest rates were high enough that it was actually meaningful enough to me, even as like a, a toddler, um, not a toddler, but to say, a, a, you know, a kid, pre, pre-teenage kid, that it made sense. And now we're back at the point where, you know, 5% interest, you start seeing that on a monthly or quarterly basis. Uh, and even with five or $10,000 in the bank, you, it starts becoming meaningful enough. Yeah. And if you have a bigger amount and actually it feels like free money, I just mm-hmm. checked one of my savings accounts and we'll go into which ones we've opened and why and what the what the options are. But just kind of a, as a teaser, I just checked one of my accounts and this month I made $92 and 29 cents in interest. That's like a really good meal. I mean, for, for you know, for in any Ukraine, it'd be, it'd be like five good meals. <laughs> and that's just free or money. A of, or, or a lot of summertime flowers for front porch. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, uh, those are free out here, but really like it's, it's, it's like a significant amount of money, like almost a hundred bucks a month and just free money for, for not doing anything. I'll take that all the time. So one other point on pay yourself first guys is ways that you can think of it. You can think of it on a percentage basis. You can think of it on a dollar amount basis. You know, 10% is a good, is a good idea as a, as a place to start and go up or, or down from there. But when you get that paycheck in, set aside 10%, that's, you're going to get that out first. You're going to get it out automatically. You're going to get it into a savings account. Back to the example of, of reinvesting dividends. A lot of people are have 100% reinvested. Congratulations. That's automatic. And you're paying yourself first. That money's coming in. You're getting it reinvested automatically. And you're getting 100% back into investments and or savings. Um, so congratulations. But you could also do it as a dollar amount. Let's say you have X coming in, you want to set aside $200 each month to be put back into savings. And this is all kind of predicated off of what we were talking about earlier with having a, a savings goal. You want to know what you're saving for. Is it an event? Is it retirement? Is it a down payment on a house? And that'll very much dictate how much you need to put away and, and the timeline that's involved in that. Yeah. So one easy, fun way to do it is let's say you want to just save for like a vacation or a new car. Take that amount, divide it by... 12 and see, okay, you know, how much do I need to save per month uh, to be able to buy that in a year or in two years or three years, whatever. So, you know, let's say it's a $30,000 vacation or wedding or, you know, or some some big event and you have two years to save for it, just divide 30,000 by 24. And that's 1,250 a month that you would have to put away. But the good thing with interest now is because that will compound, actually you'll get to it a lot quicker than, than, than you might think. Very true. Yeah. All right, Johnny, let's talk about some of the funner stuff. Now that we have our savings goal, we have best practices on the ways to save. Where do we put these savings? Before, right before we get to that, I just thought of a way where you can actually save 100% of your money. Because I think some people right now are going to kind of mentally switch off thinking, guys, I can't, you know, I'll, I'll never be able to, to, to save $1,000 a month. That sounds crazy. You know, even $200 a month sounds like a stretch, you know. So I do I, I do like that you said 10% and that, that way, you know, I think everybody can do that without hurting themselves. But 
you know what my hack is where you can actually save 100% of your your income, your, your paycheck, and, and really not change your life that much? Check into a homeless shelter in Kiev? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> get uh, get into a relationship, get, get married, and just and have, you know, just st- stop having a kid right away. Just, you know, dink it. Double income, no kids. And just live off of one person's paycheck and save 100% of the second one. <laughs> Yeah. It's a, it's an aggressive move to increase your savings, but I get it. I met a guy in Mexico that actually did that recently. The IRS was calling him and saying like, Hey, how come you haven't filed a tax return in the last 10 years? He's like, Oh, cause I moved down here and met a girl and she works and said, I didn't need to. So I'm just, I just chill at home all day. And they're like, Oh, that's uh, that's very nice of her to, to finance everything. He's like, yeah, it is. And that was that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm thinking more like, you know, <laughs> he just, he just stopped working totally. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, no. Th- this way, like you would still both work like, you know, and you could take the, the higher of the two, the two salaries or the lower, whatever it is, just don't change your life. You know, keep, keep the one apartment, get rid of the second apartment, move in together, keep the one car, carpool, you know, and, and struggle a bit. But I think you, you can absolutely do it. And, and uh, it's, uh, it's great way to build your life together if you're gonna if you're gonna marry for that i would recommend a marrying a, a really w- rich woman or b marrying a really rich, rich guy and just forget about the savings ah. <laughs> well sam's still single so go ahead go, go ahead but <laughs> still saving still saving from my five percent uh there you go you know so Let's talk about the the options, right? We have the traditional savings account, but we also have things like money markets. You know, we have bonds, we have CDs, the treasuries, annuities, and we even have these kind of uh, new new age investments like worthy bonds and other things that you may have heard of. What are your thoughts? kind of overall my thoughts are that all those things you just said are boring but remember boring is really important uh when it comes to investing because good investing is boring and also this is the way that you get ahead it's safe there's almost no risk in these things it's a way that you get that emergency fund build up and then surplus of money to be able to invest in the more speculative stuff like cryptocurrencies where you probably lose it all just kidding and we don't preach that. <laughs> I'll, I'll say this right now. Cryptocurrencies are not a place to put your savings. Like if, if you're, that's not an emergency fund, guys. That That is your, your gamble fund. But how funny is it that like, seriously, how many people take the diligent steps and everything we just talked about? They get, they got their savings plan. They cut their expenses. They save money. They get it in high interest savings account. They let it accumulate. And then they're like, all right, I got this. Now what do I do with it? Boom. I put it in something really speculative and lose it. Well, I mean, the kind of sad part is a lot of people will put their money in something like a stable coin thinking that it's actually, you know, one-to-one and it's always mm-hmm. going to be one-on-one. But there's been plenty of stable coins that have, they call it depegged or just been scams and people either lose it all. The the exchange that they had their money in goes away. They lose access to their account somehow. They might even lose their physical wallet or wherever they wrote down their, their codes. Uh, might get hacked or just like they, there's so many things that can happen and, and you're not going to get money back. Tomato off, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, but in this episode, we're not going to go into what to do after you have this money. This is all about the safe stuff. It's building up that in, uh, emergency funds building up the uh, your savings account. It's, it's accumulating, not necessarily the nest egg, but it's making use of these higher savings accounts in very safe um, yeah. instruments. We don't even call these investments, but let's go. Th- let's go through them. So Johnny mentioned a few of these savings accounts: CDs, money markets, bonds, treasuries, annuities. Th- these are things that are we think of as very safe. It's not 100% safe, but it's very safe. Johnny, you recently did more of a dive into money markets. Do you want to start there? Yeah. You know, the funny thing is I always knew money markets as just the clearing point or the clearing house or the temporary money holding that when you deposit cash into your investor account, you know, whether it's on Vanguard or on, you know, Charles Schaub or, you know, or Fidelity or any of these companies, it doesn't actually go into a checking or savings account. It goes into a money market account that kind of sits there. It might earn a little bit of interest, might not. And that's the money that you would use then to buy stocks, to call it, you know, dollar cost average in. And it was always pegged one on one. So it was very safe. You know, I later learned that the reason why they're able to pay some interest is they use that money in very, very safe investments like, you know, US treasuries and things like that. 
So I decided, you know, I was like, you know what? Some of them are paying really good interest now. They're paying, you know, four or even 5%. Let me just put my my money there, you know, instead of investing in the stock market right now, which might be a bit high. And I later learned through NPR, actually, National Public Radio of all, all places, that money markets could be risky now because, I mean, first they're not, you you know, uh, FDIC insured, they're not bank, but the US treasuries, I mean, who knows what could happen, right? Like, uh, you know, the, the US might not pay their debts, they might not raise the debt ceiling, uh, or, you know, something else might happen where you do, you're not necessarily going to lose it all, but it might not be worth one to one anymore. All right. So let's, I agree with all of that. And we just had the debt ceiling fiasco. And while there's like a ton of talk about that potentially not getting passed, it's always gotten passed through history. The chances of not passing. Uh, resolution for the for the debt ceiling is, I think, in my opinion, it's very, very low. It would basically cripple the U.S. economy. It would cripple the world economy. It would have to be some type of ad- absolutely cataclysmic event where that didn't get adjusted. But U.S. treasuries historically have been probably the safest place to put money, safer than a bank, safer than annuities, or at least at least on par with the big ones. But I think to Johnny's point, and what we'll do is after we kind of talk about these individually, we'll talk about what Johnny does specifically with his and what I do specifically with my savings. You know, a theme here, as we always talk about in all investments, is you want to diversify. You don't want to have 100% in any of these. It's best to separate it out unless you have a very small amount of money. It's really not worth the paperwork or the admin oversight to, to separate it out. But it's certainly as your dollar amount grows, you want to try to diversify at least across a couple of these. Yeah, definitely. And I would say that, you know, things like money markets, most likely it's safe I I just kind of feel like if there's going to be a bank run on it, I don't want to be you know, waiting in the back of the line when there is an alternative investment as simple as a savings account that pays almost the same amount that's actually FDIC insured. And for those who don't you know, understand how FDIC insurance works, it's the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, which is basically a government company that backs banks to make sure that up to X amount, right? and right now it's a quarter of a million, is going to be paid back to you in case a bank does fail. So because that exists and it's actually a free insurance, you know, at all banks or most banks, you know, it's kind of silly not to take it right now. And it is insurance as long as the US government is solvent and up and running. <laughs> but if they weren't for some reason, then you probably could forget about the FDIC. Um, <laughs> the other thing that is important with FDIC is while you're insured for that dollar amount, let's call it 250000 you're not guaranteed when that's going to be paid out. And so what mm. we we saw recently happen with Silicon Valley Bank, where you know they almost they almost went bankrupt and defaulted, was like some of the startups that were invested with them was like we have everything in here, and maybe we get bailed out. But when do we get bailed out? Could it take six months or a year? Like we'll be out of business if we don't have access to our savings. Mm. You can think about it with your your personal self. Like if you have everything in there, there's no guarantee when you're gonna when that's gonna get resolved. Some sometimes these things take a lot long uh, a lot of time to unwind. So you could have your money guaranteed back to you, but it could be locked up for an extended period of time. That's a really good point. And I think that's why it's so smart to have more than one. So you're at least diversified a bit. You know, you don't have to have 10 accounts unless you have, you know, $10 million. But I would say better not to have all your eggs in one basket. You never know what's going to happen. So let's talk about uh, U.S. Treasuries real quick. I've never purchased that much U.S. Treasuries, but I have a little bit of information on it to share. Uh, Recently, U.S. Treasuries were paying short-term treasuries are paying somewhere around 4.5 to 5%. The way that I've always bought them before is I've just bought the ETFs via Vanguard, which are super easy to go in and buy. I have a ticker symbol for you guys right now. It is VGSH, that's Vanguard Short-Term Treasury Index ETF. The one thing that I didn't like when I previously purchased treasuries through the index or got, let's say, got exposure to treasuries through the index is that these indexes have volatility. So when you put your money in and all of a sudden you look at it, you know, a month later and you're like, wow, I'm down 2% 2% on that. It doesn't sit right with me because I'm buying the treasure. I'm, I'm buying the treasuries because it's safe and it pays a yield. All I want to see is my money. My principal that I put in is the same and I'm getting the yield that they promised me back. I don't want to see volatility in it. So I stopped buying 
the ETF, there is volatility in there. It's not super significant. Let's look at it on a five year. Yeah, it's not super significant, but it's there. So it might not sit well with, with some people like myself. So what I try to do instead is buy the original issues. And I recently figured out how to do that through my E-Trade account. If you guys have a different account like Charles Schwab or, or elsewhere, you'll surely be able to, to figure out a way to buy the ETFs and um, not the ETFs, the treasuries in there. So going back uh, three months ago, I went in and purchased, I went in and purchased how much money? 15000 yeah, $15,000 worth of treasuries. And it was pretty easy. It was a little bit of manual, a few more clicks. That pays out 4.5% per annual, and it's actually maturing tomorrow. So I should, yeah, I should be able to see the interest come in on that. I'll share it in Boss Island and Patreon after it comes due. But that's another way to do it. If you just want to buy the original issues, you can do it through a, a, your diff, you know, name your brokerage account, you'll be able to do it through there. So with that, you should get zero volatility and you get the your principal back and your uh, in the interest payment that's due to you at the time of maturity. Very awesome. And, and we and we also had an episode, uh, we talked about I-bonds as well. That would be in there. I'm taking a look at uh, the treasurydirect.gov. There's the short-term bonds, you know, which paying a few percent. And uh, actually you can lock, if you wanted to, you can actually lock in a 20 or 30 year bond at like three and 3.28% right now. Uh, and that's actually something that we... I think a lot of people aren't going to think about is why, like the, the big question people have is why would you lock into, let's say a one year CD and, or, you know, a five year you know, CD or a 10 year bond or whatever it is, when you can actually get such high savings rates right now in just a liquid savings account. And that's something that we're going to kind of dive a bit deep into because it seems like bonds are completely worthless. Like, why would you tie your money up? for such a long time, even one year or two years, to get a similar or the same interest rate, maybe in some has less than you would a liquid savings account. Sam, you, you want to try to take a guess? I do, I do. But hold on, hold on. Let's take our sponsor break real quick and then come back with the answer. This week's sponsor of Invest Like a Boss is Nom Nom. Now, I don't have a dog yet. I'm in the market very soon, I hope. But I asked Nom Nom to send me some of this dog food so I could check it out for myself. And I'm in Los Angeles. Dogs get treated way better than humans here. So I figured if dog owners would be open to trying Nom Nom here, they're open to trying it anywhere. Well, everyone I gave Nom Nom to loved it. It's real food. You can actually see every single ingredient in there. They don't use any additives or fillers, and that means less bloating, more energy, and a happier dog overall. It's super easy to get started with Nom Nom. You just go to their website, you take a quick quiz, and they create a diet specifically catered to your dog. Nom Nom also comes with a money-back guarantee. If your dog doesn't love it within 30 days, Nom Nom will refund your first order. Order. And even better, we got an offer for you to get 50% off a no-risk two-week trial when you head over to trynom.com slash iLab. That's trynom.com slash iLab. T-R-Y-N-O-M dot com slash I-L-A-B. Go there, fill out the quick quiz about your dog, and you'll get 50% off your first order. It's trynom.com slash iLab. So Sam, the question is, and this is a tricky one, if you had two options, you can either lock in your money for two years. Let's say, here's an example, right? Uh, your money is locked in for two years and, or make it a little more extreme. Your, your money money's locked up for five years at a 4.5% interest rate. That's one option. Mm -hmm. The other option is your money is completely liquid in a savings account and you're getting 4.8% and you can take it out anytime. Why would you choose to lock yourself in? Why would you buy a bond over just putting your money in a savings account? I can't wait to hear your response to this because it's tickled... <laughs> me and like bothered me for, you know, for at least the last year because of the, where things are situated now where savings rates are so appealing compared to locking your money up. So I don't really have an answer for that except for uh, diversification. Why would you put all of your eggs in a savings account, especially an online bank that like we just went through the fiasco of Silicon Valley Bank, which 
basically an online bank, right? So for me, the most appealing place of all these things that we're talking about to put money in is a simple high interest savings account that's online with liquidity, no time deposit, right? But I still using the other ones for diversification. That's the only thing I can think of. But give me your response, Johnny. So this took me a while to figure out as well. And actually the technical term for it is called interest rate risk. And what that means, and, and here's a here's the easy example of her. This is a great transition into the next topic is Sam, where are you? Where do you put your money now and how much are you getting for it, for your savings? You want me to disclose my whole savings investment plan right now? My whole well, savings do, plan? Well, just tell me tell me one of them and, and tell me uh, one of the savings accounts that you're in uh, and how much it pays. I'm in Marcus, my favorite online bank, 4.8% mm-hmm. liquid savings, and I've got about 40% of my USD cash in it. So that's awesome, right? And you are now a victim of interest rate risk because guess why the interest rate can go down and i can't do anything about it it's already gone down it's it's as of today it? yeah as of today or th- uh, that i checked at least it's it's definitely no longer 4.8 oh i've got news for you johnny it is 4.8 you know why why because i took advantage of one of their bonus offers whereas like if you deposit money today you get 4.8 percent for the next three months but only for three months so it's probably the last month of 4.8 and then it's going to drop down to whatever you're, you're about to say or 0.15 percent what yeah and if the interest rates continue dropping which they may you know due to the economy getting better again or just the, the government changing the rates that 4.5 can drop to three to two to one to 0.01 again like it used to be mm-hmm. and in that case you would have kicked yourself in the butt for not locking in a 4.5 percent interest rate for the next five years johnny i'm having a hay fever attack can i go grab my eye drops <laughs> yeah please <laughs> That's Sam crying for not locking in that rate earlier. Oh man, I'm back. Spring is in the air. I love spring, but oh my God, I want to itch my eyeballs. (laughs) I assumed it was because you were crying that you didn't lock in the 4.5% earlier. Yeah, this is, a, this is a good point. So this kind of checks off the liquid savings account. You have 100% liquidity. Let's use my Marcus, for example. I can go in there today. I'm getting 4.8% today for Johnny's comment. I'll be getting 4.1% soon, but I can move that money tomorrow. It gets paid out monthly, which is beautiful. So for me, that's a that's just a great account. That's my favorite account. But I also have other ones that we're going to talk about here as is Johnny. So Johnny, how do how do you think I take away the, the interest rate risk through which one of these other means of, of fixed interest? All right. So if you have extra money that you don't necessarily need for an emergency, you can lock up your money at a higher interest rate in something like a CD, which is also FDIC insured to 250000 usually. I think aside from that, I mean, I, I would kind of steer away from almost anything else that has potential risk because all these other things like um, a money market, it's also, you know, the the savings rates are going to go up and down as well. I think something like a bond is good if you can get 5% long term, but I don't know. I feel like bonds were such a big deal back in the days uh, in our parents' generation when they actually paid a lot (laughs) versus now Mm -hmm. that they pay so little, they're, they're just not even worth looking into. I'd rather just have that money in a savings account, to be honest. Yeah, Johnny, we looked at doing a CD recently through Wealthfront that was paying more or less like a one percent compared to the liquid savings, and we decided not one percent more. You mean? Yeah, yeah, one percent more, and we decided not to do to go ahead with that. Do you, you remember that? Yeah, and I think maybe we're thinking too short term, or we're thinking maybe you know interest rates are going to keep going up, and that's why we're hesitant to lock it in at five point one percent or whatever it was. If we were a little bit more pessimistic, maybe it would be a good idea. For me, it's it's not part of my uh, my investment plan. Uh, and it's definitely not part of anyone's emergency fund, but just something to look into is right now, as we're recording this in June, 2023, interest rates for a savings account with no fees is an incredible 4.15%. I'm happy to keep that all day. By the time you listen to this, maybe it's lower, maybe it's higher. And one more that we haven't talked about yet is annuities. And annuities, you guys can think of as, I, I basically think of them as a CD. It's like a bank CD, but instead of being through a bank, it's through an insurance company. Now, 
They're lesser known. They're a little bit more mysterious because it's not through your favorite household bank. It's through an insurance company that probably only your parents have thought of or heard of. But historically, believe it or not, these are safer than bank deposits or even bank CDs because insurance companies on the whole, like if you go back to when there's a lot of pressure on markets in the economy, like the 2007, 2008 recession, or even back uh, into the Great Depression, you were insure, uh, insurance companies went bankrupt than banks. And that's why they are seen historically as being safer. The other great thing with annuities, specifically speaking about fixed interest rates, annuities, is that you usually get a little bit higher of a interest rate. So I've found since I've been investing in uh, annuities or putting money into annuities and also bank CDs and bank deposits at the same time, is that usually you can get basically an extra percent or two in insurance annuity. So I have used insurance annuities ever since I started investing going back almost 10 years ago. And I've always liked them. You know, I've gotten usually between three and 5%. I've locked up the money for three to five years. You know, people I've talked to said it's way too conservative. You shouldn't be doing that, et cetera. But it's like clockwork. It's the type of investment that I don't think about. You know, I don't lose, I don't lose any sleep about it. I know it's locked up in a way in a safe spot. It's not like I have access to it. I can, you know, risk it into something more speculative. So those are a good option. The downside with them is it's not as accessible as a bank CD or a deposit. It's it takes a bit of paperwork. So when I'm getting these set up, usually there's an account manager over at whoever's selling the, you know, the insurance, I don't even know what you call it, I guess, whoever's uh, selling the annuity, they'll fill out most of the paperwork for you, they'll send it over, you have to fill out a few things and sign it. But it's actually like a paper based deposit, like you have to fill out actual paperwork, and you have to actually put it in like FedEx back to the insurance company who processes it. I'm sure in time, that will become much more of a digital experience, or maybe it already is through certain providers, it's just not where I I'm doing yet. So like when I'm overseas and I'm trying to get a new annuity, it's a big pain in the ass. But other than that, it's where I put the majority of the money that we're talking about. Uh, up actually about 20% of my net wealth right now I have in insurance plan or annuities, fixed interest annuities. Uh, and if you guys want to learn more about it, you can take a listen to episode four with Stan, the annuity man, and Sam. Man, that goes to show what a staple it was in my investing. Episode four. And that was probably arguably my biggest investment at the time. It was one of the first investments I got to know. And I still invest uh, in annuities through Stand the Annuity Man. What is it? Going seven years since that episode. Yeah. And, you know, back then it made a lot of sense because, you know, what what interest are you getting in your annuities? So funny enough is a lot of my annuities were maturing in the last couple of years when interest rates were almost zero. And then through the annuities, you could get like two and a half, three percent if you locked it up for five years. And I'm like, why bother? You know, zero percent or two and a half percent. I just preferred to have the liquidity. But now what I did is I just I basically cashed them out and took the cash and either kept it in liquid savings or I uh, reinvested in other things. But now the interest rates are much higher. You can get like 6%, 6.5% on the, on the five-year. So yeah, I'm definitely considering putting more money in those now. Yeah, it definitely makes sense. And that's a way to mitigate that interest rate, you know, flexibility risk that we're talking about. Because I have a feeling it's going to keep dropping down, but who knows? Who knows what's going to happen? Actually, I'm taking a look right now at the best savings account rates for June 2023. And people love this topic too. It gets so much chat like whenever we raise it. Everyone's got their favorite online bank or place to save money. Yeah. Well, the thing is, these banks will just do like a promo, right? Just to get their name out there. Like right now, the highest one I, I found is 4.85% to a bank called Citbank, CIT. CIT. <laughs> I yeah. just found that one too. Yeah. So when some of our Patreons were talking about CIT. Yeah. I've never heard of them, but now they get free marketing just by having 4.85%, yes, yeah, $5,000 minimum balance. But the, here's the thing is once they get enough customers, what's stopping them from just just quietly dropping it back down to 4.1% or, you know, mm -hmm. uh, or whatever they think they can they can get away with. You know, most people aren't going to move their money. They're going to say, ah, that's already there. You know, let's not, you know, not worry about it. it unless it's it's a huge, a huge difference. But even it was, let, let's say PNC decided, hey, we're going to, you know, have a high rate promo, you know, with $1 minimum balance. You know, what if you move your money from, uh, from sit over there and then the very next month they drop there? So yeah. it, it's a it's a game of cat and mouse. And that's why I put my money in Marcus. And I was like, ah, you know, I think it's good enough, 4.15. But then I got suckered into moving my money into the Apple 
card savings account. Oh boy. Because they were paying 4.85. And I was like, oh my God, this is crazy. So I moved 30 grand there, but it didn't make any sense to me because both Marcus and the Apple Savings Bank are owned by, guess who? Marcus is owned by Goldman Sachs. So is the Apple uh, card. It's, oh it's operated by Goldman Sachs. So I, I literally moved it from one Goldman Sachs savings account to another just to get the the higher interest. And you know what? You know what? For all the listeners, you know what happened when Johnny did that? Also, additional paperwork. Yeah, probably. Well, it's one more. It's one more. It's one more tax form to file. Yeah. If nothing else. Right. Yeah. It's a. It's a. And that's something. What am I? I'm like. What am I doing? It seemed like the prudent thing to do, but as of today, both have settled back down quietly. You know, you don't mm-hmm. get a notification or anything. You just quietly logged in. I'm like, all right, well, you're both paying 4.15 again now. I think that's, when it comes to this stuff, for me, it doesn't justify trying to chase like the extra 25 basis points. These things are going to move around a lot. I think that's why I like Marcus. Another one I haven't used, but it's always up there, like at, at kind of the top of of interest and popularity is Ally Bank. But I think what's why I like Marcus is I've just been tracking it for so long that I know they're not like, they're always competitive with rates. They might be 10 basis points or 20 basis points off a competitor, but they're always up there in the top. They have a good track record. They've got a good system. So like, it's just, a, it's one I'm comfortable with. I definitely wouldn't chase, you know, a, a small margin of additional interest on a bank that I hadn't heard of. I think you just want to be in a, you want to be in a bank that's got competitive rates and that you're comfortable with and that it's, it's easy to move money in and out of. I think that's probably what's important when it comes to these. Most recently, I've started putting money in Wealthfront just because I, I like their overall offering. Also, they're they're backed or they're owned and backed by UBS now, which probably gives it a lot more stability. But they they most recently had a very competitive rate of about 4.85%. And Johnny, actually, I think you know more about like how their bank and FDIC is structured, but it seems pretty pretty legit. With Wealthfront, actually, they partner with a bunch of other banks. So that money in the Wealthfront account isn't sitting in Wealthfront's New York or wherever they are. It's sitting in an actual partner bank. So they actually have this um, kind of smart scheme where you can actually get up to $5 million FDIC insured because they have so many partner banks that they will kind of diversify your money for you uh, on your on your behalf. That sounds pretty good. Yeah. Oh yeah, Johnny. So we've re- we've covered a lot of the different options out there: savings account, CDs, money markets, bonds, treasuries, annuities, which I don't think is on everybody's mind, but it's been sort of my favorite, at least for the larger allocation of my savings. Let's review quick exactly what we're doing with these different accounts where it is, any type of percentage breakdown that you have. Yeah, absolutely. So for me, I just try to have, I try to have less than 10% of my total net worth in savings. I think anything more than it's just, it could be better invested somewhere else. Normally, I actually would just want to have a year, maybe two years max of, of living expenses. And my living expenses aren't that high. So I wouldn't want to have more than fifty or $60,000 uh, in kind of liquid money. But right now, I feel like there was nowhere else to really put it. Uh, I felt like the you know index funds are up and down. Uh, I don't want any more real estate. And because the interest rates for savings accounts are so high right now, I was sitting on a little bit more cash than, than than I would normally. So I have about 80 grand sitting in between the two Goldman Sachs accounts, 50 grand in Marcus and 30 grand in uh, Apple. The warning with the Apple savings account is you can only move 10,000 at a time. Mm-hmm. So it's it's not very liquid if you need to get all your money out quickly. Uh, I actually regret opening the Apple savings account. I should have just left all of it in Marcus or you know somewhere else. I think I have 5,000 in wealth from you know, which is probably another form now, which is stupid of me to, to have done. So I would have just, in, in retrospect, I would have had le- either left all of it in, I would probably would have done Marcus and Wealthfront and and call, call of the day. I like it. That raises a good point with, with any type of transferring limits of your accounts, especially if you have larger dollar sums in there. That is... I mean, that's basically a form of capital control <laughs> when it comes down yeah. to it. So for me, what I'm doing is I have I have about 40% or I'll separate this out because I'll think of more short term and midterm. Short term, I think, is more kind of the stuff that we've been talking on this. It's like savings, CDs, treasuries, but things that are pre, you know li- liquid or have liquidity, maybe 
a 12 month window, the longer term stuff. So I have the majority of my kind of quote unquote available cash in, in annuities, got probably 20% of my net wealth in those. And those are laddered, but the average term is about five years. So I have them set up in a way that every year, one of the annuity policies is maturing, which means every 12 months, I'll be getting a chunk of money that I can decide whether I want to cash it out or to roll it back into a new policy. So that was actually a suggestion by Stan, the annuity man, when I originally set him up. And I think it's it's a, such an easy thing to put in place, but it'd be so easy not to do. But be, it's given me a lot of comfort to keep those because it's not like I have 20% of my wealth locked up for five years. It's like, okay, I probably only have 3% because I've got five or six different annuity policies, if that makes sense. And mm -hmm. every year, one of them is coming due. Yep. So that 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 aside, I've got of my more liquid stuff, my near term within, say, within 12, 12 months liquidity window, I've got 40% in Marcus, and that's just high interest savings. It's There's no, no CD, no, no lockup period. Same with Wealthfront, except provision on that is I have a three-month lockup window just to get that higher bonus rate of 4.8%, but that's probably done in, I think it's done this month. So really, I've got uh, about 40% in wealth front, very competitive rate to Marcus. The only reason I did this, again, there's almost no advantage in doing it other than diversification. That's 100% the reason that I have it separated out there. And then I've got just about 5% in short-term treasury bills. I did this honestly, guys, just more as figuring out how to do it for myself and also be able to share it with you guys. But I don't think, unless I was putting a lot more cash into this sort of part of my, of my portfolio, I don't think I would use it just because it's a bit of a headache. I don't see the advantage of doing it in terms of interest rates. It's really just diversification. But I think between the two accounts of Marcus and Wealthfirm, I'm, I'm diversified enough. And then I keep just about 5% in like my checking accounts via Wealth, Wells Fargo and Bank of America. Now, this is one point I just want to stress with the listeners is like, even with your banks, really, you should have multiple banks. Mm -hmm. If you have any any amount of, of money, let's just let's say if you have more than 50 grand in these in the banks, I would have two different banks. Banks can go bust, they can get tied up, they can put in capital controls. It costs you almost nothing to have an additional bank. It's it's just a good backup plan. If you start having a lot of money in banks, you know, you gotta keep the money under the FDIC if you're smart about it, right? Mm -hmm. So quick story, I had a, a friend, he had he had five million dollars in the US banking system here in 2007. When everything started to crash and he had his basically attorney and team quickly set him up like 20 different bank accounts so he could spread the money across 20 different bank accounts and it's very smart because we've all heard stories of banks going bust and people losing all their money i mean it, it literally happens it doesn't happen very frequently in developed nations but if you have money overseas and banks like in the mediterranean or smaller countries it happens pretty regularly so you definitely want to have diversification even within banks like i said if you have if you're in the us and you have bank of america it costs you almost nothing to go just get a wells fargo account and just have it there with 20 bucks in it or 100 bucks in it and you can always move money in between the banks so the way I have it set up with my banks, Marcus, Bank of America, and Wells Fargo, is I keep Marcus in the middle. That's where the majority of my cash savings are. And I can, in one click, transfer money to my Bank of America or transfer it to Wells Fargo. And those banks are mostly dormant, except just for checking purposes. But I know like Marcus was ever to get in trouble or any of the other banks were getting in trouble. I can pretty easily move money um, through that sort of intermediary bank. And it's all all connected. And it's in Marcus's bank. Like if you, any of you guys have it or seen it, it's so simple. It's like five buttons. If you log into like Bank of America, there's literally a million different things to click on. Yeah. With Marcus, it's like three, it's like three things you can do. Only a couple yeah. menus and a couple of things you can do. And I like the simplicity of it. It doesn't give you like ADD every time you, you sign into it. Yeah, I, I also like it that it's just purely for savings. You know, there's no ATM card. There's no checks, which is actually a um, it reduces your liability because nobody, you know, it's really hard to hack. There's, there's nothing there's nothing really connecting you there except for your, your Marcus uh, account ID. But I like that. The only thing I don't like about Marcus is you can't log in from a lot of countries. That's true. That is true. I think... I've had a lot of trouble with that. I seem to have used VPNs and kind of gets around that. Yeah, thank God. But I'm not sure it works all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And who knows? Like one day they might just decide, you know what? No, you know, we're not going to allow VPNs anymore. And then I have 50 yeah. grand just stuck there. Yeah. So, yeah, very, very you know, point. I'm going yeah. to fly back to the U.S. just to unlock my account, which would, you know, which I would hate. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I would second everything you just said. Uh, I personally have a couple different accounts. I have a Shab's checking account, Chase, and 
I have a Revolut account just for mm. when I'm in Europe, and I can just store money in other currencies. When the pound was weak, and also the euro was weak, the euro was actually mm. weaker than the dollar. I actually transferred some money, uh, converted some money into euros, and just sitting there now for me to spend whenever I'm in Europe. Hey, buddy. Yeah. Well, maybe Ukraine will join. Maybe. Maybe Ukraine will, will join the EU soon and you'll be able to just spend it right there in Kiev. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I don't think the grievance is ever going to change. But so, so that is a very good point, Johnny. And before we round, round out the episode, we should talk real quick about foreign currency savings. I know it's something we both dabbled with. I'm going to make a guess that we both have had fairly bad experiences in doing so. But let's touch base quickly on that. Where do you stand with foreign currencies in your own portfolio, but also is, do, you, do you intend to do any more in any way? So I have money in, I guess, a couple different currencies besides the, you know, literally euro and, and pound I have in my Revolut. I have a Thai bank account that I actually have no access to. <laughs> so, and they wouldn't, they wouldn't, they wouldn't let me into my bank account because I didn't have the passbook, which is this old school. Oh. The worst. Yeah, like Americans don't even know what it is anymore because it's like we haven't seen this since I was a kid. You know, it's like literally like a book that you would bring to the ATM to get printed every time you made a deposit or the draw. Like nobody does it anymore, but they wanted to see that. And the phone number that I had had when I, you know, 10 years ago when I when I opened that account, that's gone. You know, every every time I go to Thailand, I get a new account. So I'll unlock it next time I go and I'll just bring all the forms. I actually happen to have that passbook on me, you know, somehow still, but it's it's a pain in the ass. Yeah, and good luck getting a new passbook if if you've got like I went through this whole fiasco in Thai in Thailand where like I was like I went to the local bank and they're like, Oh, um, you have to go where you opened up your bank account to get a new passbook. And I'm like, you I have to to fly two hours down to Phuket to go to this bank where I opened up my account to get a new passbook. How, like that's stupid. That's stupid. It's, it's so ridiculous. And then I'm locked out of my account until that happens. It's like, what if I can't go for the next three months? I just have access, don't have access to the account. And some of the things they do there are like, they're so good and progressive with like the QR scan payments and stuff. But some of it's just like ridiculously backwards. Yeah, absolutely. So there's that. Uh, I have a Ukrainian bank account just because there's a lot, of, a lot of places only take Ukrainian cards or you need to transfer money through like a digital app. It's super useful when you live here, but I try not to keep more than a few thousand dollars uh, in grieving at the time because it is a volatile, volatile currency. Luckily, I didn't lose too much when the grieving changed. I didn't have more than a few thousand dollars uh, in there, but you know, it is a, a risk, but fun. Uh, kind of bonus savings is if you don't want to invest, if you're not, let's say you're not an American or you are and you just want to invest in a different currency or different country, places like Ukraine are paying crazy amounts. I think you can get a 16% interest rate uh, if you lock in your, your you convert the money to Ukrainian Grivna and lock it up for a year. And this gets, this gets you. I mean, I think when we started investigating foreign currency deposits like overseas, at the start of this podcast, we're like, oh man, this is so appealing. Like we can go to Mongolia and get 20%. Like <laughs> who would have known? And this is one of the reasons that I invested in RMB originally, because I thought, well, China, seven years ago, China looked like it was on the up and up. RMB fixed deposits were paying like 5% compared to US dollar 0%. I'm like, cool, man, I'll throw, you know, whatever, a couple hundred grand at it. I've got my ass kicked on that, man. Yeah, it's for sucks. multiple reasons. Um, now the tables have turned where the US dollar is paying 5%, but RMB is paying zero. Mm. Secondly, through my bank in Singapore, they don't actually hold the RMB in their account. They like have a contract for it when you when you buy and hold RMB. They basically get a contract for it, but they but it only gives you one option to get out of that currency. There is like there's not a market for it. The bank my bank in Singapore just says, here's the offer. Here's the exchange rate we can offer you. Uh. And it's like, if you say no, which I have, I'm like, all right, transfer my RMB to my uh, my HSBC account in Hong Kong. They're like, no, we're like, we can't, can't do that. Like you don't actually own the RMB. You just have a contract on it. Like you can't transfer it. So they can say whatever they want. They literally can say whatever price they want. I either have to hold my RMB or take the price they want. And it's a terrible rate, Johnny. Yeah. It's terrible. Like if it's, if it's seven to one RMB to the dollar, they'll give me like 6.6 .6 or something. It's crazy. Yeah, I was it's so crazy. mad when I figured this out. I'm like, this is mafia shit. Yeah. So in general, I would not recommend people mess with with 
foreign exchange, uh, holding money in different currencies, unless you actually live there and you want to spend it. You know, that way, worse comes to worse, you know, I'm just going to spend my Grivna, like even if it's worth a bit less. Um, yeah. But I personally haven't locked in any of my Grivna to make 16%, even though it's been tempting, to be honest. I just don't like keeping my money outside of dollars right now, especially in, in the Grivna, which is very volatile. So it doesn't make sense. Like, And I just have enough in there to, to kind of spend over the next few months. Yeah. And so I agree with what Johnny says. I got my ass kicked on trying to play the foreign currency game over the last seven years, generally speaking. But where I will do it, which is in parallel with Johnny's plan, is like if I see the exchange rate go to a historical discount of where it is, and it's in a country that I spend time and or money, then I'll, I'll transfer money in bulk during that time. So a good case is like recently the par, uh, the euro to the dollar was basically par one to one. It's like, dude, when has it ever been there? So transfer money in there, it's sitting in account. And then when I go spend euros, it's like, wow, I got everything at a 20% discount. Same yeah. in Thailand, it's a good opportunity to do it. But other than that, I think one thing you can think about doing that is in foreign currencies, if you're interested in having foreign currencies, is there's investments that you can make that pay out foreign currencies. Mm -hmm. And that's at least a productive asset. So you might invest in like a REIT in Hong Kong or Singapore that pays out Hong Kong dollar or Singapore dollar or Australian dollars. And you can actually accumulate dividends in those currencies. So that's a way to get, get a hedge without actually trying to specifically win at uh, a currency pair. Yeah, absolutely. And if you're not American and you somehow sat through this whole podcast the king that none of this applies to you well you're probably in luck that your country probably pays there's probably some kind of savings accounts that that also pay a decent amount i just looked it up for the uk what would you think that they're paying right now at some of these big banks like lloyd's or barclays you know the ones that you actually heard of well johnny i've, I've cheated as well because i have the oh. list of foreign currencies up in front of me as well right now. But it looks like, okay, I checked the rates in my BBS Bank of Singapore. Okay. And for UK, they are paying about 4.2% on a 12-month savings. Yeah. yeah. And actually, there's even some, uh, I found that allows withdrawals, 3.8%. So yeah, really not bad. So take a look at the options where you live, because if you were American and you had your money in, was it uh, Bank of America or mm -hmm. Chase in a savings account, guess how much you would, you would be getting today? Please tell me under 1% so I can just say why. 0.01%. <laughs> why? Why? Does, it, does that make any sense? Like yeah. how much money are they losing to these online banks by just not, if they could just give you 1% or 2%, it would be so much more appealing to keep money there than basically 0% when the other other banks are paying almost five. Uh, I don't know. I, I actually, I, I think that their play is if they gave 1%, you, more people probably still wouldn't be happy. Because then <laughs> they're they're used to getting nothing, and they really you know if they if they know enough or they carry enough to ch to check where the rate is, they're gonna want a competitive rate of over four percent. And Chase and Bank of America and these big banks don't want to pay it. They're probably making so much money now just on the ignorance of people, just not that you know. Mm -hmm that just don't bother transferring out the money, don't listen to podcasts like this, You know, don't know that they could be getting 4% by just opening an online account through something like Marcus, which is just as secure as you know these two other big banks. Man, it's so bad. Like Bank of America is making, if you have money in Bank of America, they're making like 7% off of you right now. Yeah. They're paying you zero and they're, they're, <laughs> they're leveraging your money to lend out more money at a high interest rate just doesn't yeah. seem right but one thing we can be sure is it's not an oversight by them it's not like oh, <laughs> oh we, we missed this like they for sure have huge armies of statisticians that are figuring out exactly what they should be offering and when but i just want to give the listeners a few more currency pairs so they can see what other currencies are offering right now so us dollar 4.7 percent gbp british pound is 4.3 australia dollar 3.2 uh, Canadian dollar, 4.5. New Zealand, 4.4. Um, and then we get into some of the smaller ones. So we're talking Swiss francs, 1.2. <laughs> Uh, Japanese yen, zero, just a straight up zero, nothing. Well, at least um, not negative like it used to be. Yeah, that's right. Good point. Um, RMB is basically yeah, 80 Worthless. basis points, less, <laughs> less than 1%. 1%. Hong Kong dollar, which is actually 
pegged to the US dollar 2.7%. Now that's, I'm glad I just looked at this because I have a lot of Hong Kong dollar savings, which all I probably have to do is move it over into a savings account instead of a checking account. Mm -hmm. And I'll be ripping close to 3% on that. Thank you uh, for the savings episode in 2023 for that. Uh, and Euro is 2.1%. So those are some of the larger currencies. Um, be sure to check out where you're at, see if there's online banks that can offer you a little bit more savings than your um, your flagship bank checking. Yeah, absolutely. So do your, do your friends and your family a favor, share this episode with them to make sure that they're not missing out on 4% or higher interest rate that is completely safe by the FDIC. It's We've never lived in a better or easier time to make 4%. I, I, I would definitely say that. And if you guys have your savings down and have a sum of money that you're looking to invest further than just uh, in a savings account or one of these fixed interest uh, investment e- or instruments that we've talked about in this episode, we've got an entire episode recorded. That is episode 182. That's iLab 182. The title is If I Have X Dollars, Where Do I Invest It? And we kind of go through the next levels of considerations and different ways that you can invest that money. Yeah, absolutely. Because if you have all your money in this, you really kind of just keep up with inflation. So you're not really getting any richer. But at least not getting poorer, which is always a good thing. Very true, very true. All All right, Johnny. Good talking to you, buddy. Keep saving and see you guys uh, either in the Boss Town or the Patreon. Thanks for supporting the show. See you guys in the next one. Thanks for listening to the Best Like a Boss podcast. Join our mailing list at investlikeaboss.com to get exclusive access to our insider investment portfolios and our private members forum. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe on iTunes or your favorite podcast app. Tell your friends and leave us a review in the iTunes store. It helps more than you know. See you guys next week.